You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Hello and welcome to Parliament Matters, the new podcast from the Hansard Society about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Every week we're going to be analysing what's going on behind the Gothic facade of Westminster. We'll be explaining how the system works and hearing about the latest research on the workings of Parliament and politics. And looking back at key moments of parliamentary history. We're going to talk in this episode about the King's Speech, the new laws the government has proposed, the state opening of Parliament. And indeed, why do we have a state opening of Parliament? Why do we have this slightly strange system of parliamentary kind of cycles that start with a King's Speech and close with a prorogation ceremony, providing a sort of hard stop to the legislative agenda? And then we'll be talking to Lord Norton, political savant and Tory peer, who dropped by to discuss the 1922 committee, a mysterious institution whose inhabitants may or may not wear grey suits, but who can make or break a Conservative Prime Minister. But first, the King's speech. The King's Speech is the beginning of a parliamentary year. It's when His Majesty sets out, on behalf of the Prime Minister of the day, the programme of laws they're planning to pass in the coming year. But we all know that an election is due in the next 12 months or so. So how much of what's being proposed this time around is actual law that they want to get on the statute book, and how much is political performance art, I suppose you might say, something intended to create dividing lines with Labour, something intended to set up the debates of the next general election. Ruth, you've been looking at the the list. Yeah, so there's 21 bills, Mark, that the the government has has identified. Of course, the thing to remember is the government can bring bills in that are not in the King's Speech, and conversely, there may be things listed in the King's Speech that they never get to, even if the the session, you know, is a a normal one, not, not... possibly in a general election year. So there's there's no guarantees here that we will see this legislation, but this is what the government's putting forward as, it, as its plans. It's it, a statement of intent, but kind of soft intent. Yes, yeah, so it's got sort of three headings, if you like. It says that uh, the government wants to new bills to strengthen society, to grow the economy, and to keep people safe. So that's sort of its broad narrative. It's actually the fewest number of bills since the Queen's speech in 2014. Again, a pre-election year. Yep. And, um, you know, the number of bills in and of itself is not not a great indicator because some of these bills might be quite short. Sometimes you get bills which are just a few clauses and some of them will be sort of 250, 350 pages long. So, you know, the, num- the sheer number itself is, is, is not necessarily a great guide to, to what's going to happen or indeed to how controversial they're going to be. And, of course, what's not discussed in the, the, the King's speech and what's not included in that 21 list of bills is the finance bill, which will be needed to to keep the nation's finances running after the budget next year. And of course, there'll also have to be Northern Ireland legislation to fill out for the fact that devolution has collapsed in Northern Ireland for the time being. And that's meant that uh, the Westminster Parliament has at regular intervals had to set a budget for Northern Ireland that requires a bill. So that is something that will be fairly unavoidable as well for ministers, unless miraculously the devolved institutions revive. Yeah, so you can see already that's we're going to be more than 21 bills if indeed the government gets through the, the whole programme. But as you mentioned, the general election is going to come into play here because the timing of the election, it's looking increasingly unlikely that it's going to be May, time to coincide with the local elections, given the poll ratings of the, of the government, and perhaps more likely that they're going to run into October or December of next year. In that case, they're going to have more legislative time available. But if they did want to go for an earlier date, then, of course, the guillotine on the legislative programme will fall earlier um, and they'll, they'll have less chance to get things through. Having said that, it doesn't feel like many of these bills are so critical that they couldn't either you know, lose them for a quicker election uh, or indeed bang them through in terms of negotiations with the opposition. And there was a rather withering verdict from uh, Labour uh, MP Chris Bryant who said that we could pass all this lot in a fortnight and then get on to have a general election, possibly a poetic exaggeration (laughs) there, a touch. But it it isn't the most weighty programme of new bills that either of us has ever seen, put it gently. 
No, and having said that, I've been struggling to think of Queen's speeches in the past that, you know, have sort of turned the tide, turned the political fortunes of the party. Certainly if you have a gracious speech at the start of a parliament after a big election victory... I always love that term, the gracious gracious, speech. The gracious speech. I was trying to ensure I didn't sort of um, blunder over either King's speech or Queen's speech. But if, if you have a big election victory, like sort of a landslide, you know, Tony Blair in 1997, Margaret Thatcher in sort of 79 that big change election, then yes, the the speech afterwards, the legislative programme does look big and meaty and is all about change and reform. But when you're at the the back end of a parliament and you're 20 points behind in the polls, it doesn't look quite so, quite so good. There has been talk that there are few opportunities left for the government to have a kind of game-changing moment where it can reset the political mood. This doesn't appear to be it. And now immediately MPs are casting their lonely eyes towards the 22nd of November when Jeremy Hunt is due to deliver his autumn financial statement as Chancellor. And the the hope amongst Conservative MPs seems increasingly that he will come up with something that will really grab the attention of the electorate, a big tax cut being probably the main thing that he might be able to offer them. And who knows whether he'll be able to do that or not, because that, of course, depends on all Mm. sorts of judgments about the financial markets, and they will have seared into their memory the experience of the Liz Trust tax cut that the financial markets were unconvinced by, which caused all sorts of havoc, and uh, not that long ago either. This is one of the sets of kind of noises off that mean that this hasn't been a reset moment for the government, because whatever good publicity there might be to be had from this King's speech, it's competing with some of the astounding things coming out of the COVID inquiry at the moment about quite what was going on in Downing Street during the pandemic, for example. It's competing with the equally lurid revelations or I suppose you'd better use some scare inverted commas around that from Nadine Doris's account of the fall of <laughs> Boris Johnson and some of the uh, stories there that have been splashed across most of the front pages in the last few weeks. And now, of course, the rather bare knuckle battle that seems to be emerging between Rishi Sunak and his Home Secretary and potential uh, rival for the Tory leadership, Suella Braverman. Even as we speak, I'm checking my Twitter feed to make sure that Suella Braverman hasn't been dismissed while we're recording. Who, Who knows what's going on there? But when all that is going on around you, you're not going to get all that much publicity for a a legislative agenda of kind of tech bro measures about digital markets and self-drive cars and criminal justice tweaks and reforms to this and new authorities for that. Well, shall we get into that, Mark? Shall we actually start on the, the list of bills and well, have, a, have a look at those in a bit more detail? Well, talk us through. I mean, there's, there's what, four criminal justice bills? There's five, I think. I mean, it depends how you cut it, but they've sort of listed listed four or five. So I mean, the one that um, catches the eye is the the, the bill to um, reform sentencing. So the government is proposing that uh, they'll be tougher on the uh, the sentences of the most violent offenders. So you'll get tougher sentences, um, you get more sort of political oversight of, of some of those. More life means life occasions. Yeah, but at the other end of the spectrum, interestingly, um, taking a different approach to shorter sentences and saying that, you know, if you are in facing a 12-month sentence, they wouldn't necessarily get a custodial sentence because normally you'd only serve half of that and actually therefore you'd you'd get a suspended sentence which you can argue is a response to the situation with prisoner overcrowding but the government rightly saying that successive governments have looked at this and have have recognised that shorter sentences is is not a good thing if you keep Uh, sending to prison. An expensive way of making bad people worse I think is the phrase that used to float around. Yeah so it'd be interesting to see what what the response to to that one is. You've got to to think uh, how how long is it since we had a Queen's speech that didn't include the words crackdown and tougher sentencing? This is the kind of boilerplate rhetoric that accompanies every single Queen's speech or King's speech that I can remember. Yeah and antisocial behaviour also features in, in this uh, King's speech um, and it's featured in lots and lots of, of uh, Queen's speeches in the past. I mean I remember it being a big feature of Tony Blair's government um, multiple antisocial behaviour bills to crack down on, on that issue um, We've also got a, a criminal criminal justice bill which is I think is this is one area where there may be some opposition in conservative ranks from the sort of people like David Davis the um, civil libertarian yeah the sort of the, that wing of the conservative party the sort of concerns about measures which will allow the police to enter premises some suspicion of organized crime for example without warrants this is for example if they trace stolen mobile phones presumably yeah. by their signal to a particular address they can just pile in there yeah 
Should we look at some of the economic bills then? Go on. Then. One that I think is is going to be controversial, and it's one that uh, is is perceived as the government attempting to sort of put a wedge issue between them and the the, the the Labour Party in relation to net zero, and that's the offshore petroleum licensing bill for drilling offshore for oil and gas. And this, of course, goes into the whole debate about climate change and net zero. And the government makes the argument that actually it's better to have um, that provision ourselves rather than relying on more expensive imports of fossil fuels. One of the more withering lines in in Rishi Sunak's speech in the opening, the the, the debate on the King's speech, was a suggestion that Labour aren't against oil and gas, they're just against British oil and gas. (laughs) Cue here, here's from his own benches. And then, I mean, you've talked about tech and and um, automated vehicles. Yes, the, the, the tech bro section the of the speech. The tech bro section that um, possibly Rishi Sunak wrote himself. Yeah, automated vehicles. So um, I have to say, this is the bit that terrifies me, that self-driving vehicles, if you were to crash in a self-driving vehicle, you would be immune from prosecution, which sounds like a good thing. But I have to say, I'm not very keen on self-driving. <laughs> I think unleashing me on the roads and something like that. It's yeah. a terrifying concept. <laughs> So uh, we'll have to see what happens with uh, with that one. There's another one, media bill. Is there's the government's proposing to introduce some changes, and um, interestingly, they're planning to repeal some provisions in legislation that were introduced after the Leveson inquiry. Which, if you recall, it was the public inquiry that took place um, looking at media standards in the aftermath of the phone hacking inquiry Absolutely. that affected sort of Rupert Murdoch's you know, company was found to be phone hacking all sorts of you know, you, the royal you, family, you, businessmen, sports personalities. Uh, and of course there's legal action around that still going on but yep. um, the uh, sight of uh, uh, Uncle Rupert coming into Parliament and announcing yes. this was the humblest day of his life still remains with us so, e- even before someone applied a custard pie to his face. <laughs> we'll, we'll long live in the memory. So the government's proposed to repeal some of the provisions that were introduced then in in an Act of Parliament. But interestingly, they've never actually brought them into force. And this highlights, I think, something that a lot of members of the public and indeed some MPs don't realise, which is that although you might spend, you know, hundreds of hours on a piece of legislation scrutinising it, it is law of the land, but if the provisions haven't been commenced through a commencement order they will not necessarily come into effect. Yeah, there's a sort of trigger that has to be pulled before certain parts of a law are activated. And, and the bit we're talking about here is uh, a provision that media organisations that hadn't signed up to a regulator would be in a position where if um, someone sued them for libel, they would be liable for the sewers' costs, yeah. even if they, that, that attempt to sue them was unsuccessful, which... Uh, a lot of media organisations not entirely unreasonably found uh, a bit onerous. Yeah, so they'll they'll welcome this, but um, in legislation, in in these bills, there'll be provisions to to say that the specific clauses will come into force straight away, or it may say they'll come into force after a particular event or a particular date, or it'll be left open to ministers to decide when they come into force. And if they don't commence them, then they they never come into force. And that's what's happened here. I think that is interesting because lots of people don't realise that that's the case. And you can have whole sections of an Act of Parliament that are never commenced. And famously, the the, the Act to set the date of Easter has never (laughs) never been commenced. I'm dimly aware that I think there is legislation on the books to require age verification for porn sites that's never been triggered because there was a private member's bill to attempt to activate that bit of uh, some previous Act of Parliament, which never got anywhere but there was an attempt yeah i mean there's some suggestions that actually the government shouldn't be able to do this that if they you know there should be almost like a sunset if they don't introduce the provisions within a certain amount of time then they fall away but, quite um, an easy way to get yourself off the hook though is, is yeah. you, you diffuse some opposition to your bill by putting in some clause that you then don't activate Yep. and then just withers away. I suppose it, it's, it's, it's a good way of sort of bamboozling your back benches if you really wanted to. Yeah. Then the other one um, that uh, we can talk about is the tobacco and vapes bill. Um, ah, yes. Yeah, so if you're under 14, you'll never be able to buy tobacco products, I think is the, the uh, thrust of this. This is the one that I think might get a bit of opposition on the Conservative back benches on the basis that however bad you think tobacco is, should it really be the business of government to basically try and rule it out for future generations forever? And that's quite an interesting argument to have. Rishi Sunak feels that this is a very important public health measure that can stop smoking-related illness more or less forever. So 
a public health versus individual liberty issue really writ large being fought out possibly on the Conservative backbenches, I think Labour would probably back this, but I'm pretty sure that there will be some Conservative voices who are yeah. distinctly uncomfortable about yeah. it. Yeah, that, that backs back to that sort of civil libertarian um, backbenches that we were talking about earlier. Once the government's decided on when the election is going to be, and once it's, it's, it's effectively determined a dissolution date for, to dissolve the Parliament for the election, you're then going to have you know, anything between a couple of weeks to just a few days for what we call the legislative wash-up, which were basically all those bills in this speech that have not got royal assent and that have been laid before Parliament, gone through perhaps some scrutiny, uh, but not, not fully completed the process, they'll be the subject of immense negotiations with the opposition about mm. how they can get agreement on those bills and ram them through the final stages before dissolution. Because they can only go through very quickly before yeah. dissolution if the opposition is prepared to pay ball. And the opposition's price for that is, oh, you've got to take out this clause that we really don't yeah. like. Oh, you've got to rewrite it this way so that we're happy. And so there's a huge sort of watering down process that takes place in the wash-up, if I'm not mixing my kitchen metaphors <laughs> a bit too far here. Yeah, so one to watch and some something I think we'll probably talk about a bit nearer the, the time. Um, the other thing, of course, we don't get much clarity on uh, is HS2 and what yes. is going to happen to that yeah. that legislation because there is there is a bill for the next stage of HS2 that was carried over from the last session. So it's a bill that's had you know hundreds of hours spent on it so far and it's become a select committee that's been looking at it has basically suspended its proceedings pending... Uh, further information from the government and instruction from the House of Commons about what to do. I thought we might get some sense from the King's Speech uh, yes. what might happen, or sort of the you know at least the sort of briefing around the King's Speech. But I haven't heard anything, and the only indication we've had is that the Permanent Secretary at the Department of Transport appeared before the committee in the last few days and indicated that primary legislation would be needed to deal with some of the fallout issues from the Prime Minister's decision to scrap the next stage yeah, of HST, but we don't know what form that legislation is going to take. Are they just going to amend this existing bill or are they going to need new legislation? It's really very hard to underestimate the amount of time that MPs have spent on HS2. There have been several HS2 bills doing each stage of the unfolding and the programme. Uh, and uh, the ima- it's, it's an astonishing. I once accompanied uh, members of one of the bill committees around a chunk of rural Warwickshire where they were <laughs> talking to people in the various... Oh, it was Miss Marple country. You kept expecting a sharp-eyed old lady to dart out and solve a quick murder while <laughs> the proceedings were underway. And it would have made quite a good Miss Marple uh, plotline, I suspect. But you, you'd come to these places and groups of residents would make speeches about how they needed a cutting here or a tunnel there or they were very worried about having 24-hour-a-day lorries thundering through their community or whatever it was and the MPs would listen and take notes and sometimes the bill would be changed a bit to accommodate those kind of concerns and it's a very intensive incredibly detailed bit of work mm. that has to be done and what you've got to remember is these kind of bills are in, in essence a kind of planning permission yeah. this is how you get permission to do all the things that are necessary, the kind of compulsory purchasing and all the rest of it. Uh, So there's no obligation when you've got planning permission to actually go ahead and build what you've got permission to build. So to that extent, Rishi Sunak was able to just sort of bring the whole thing to a halt with a wave of his hand. And I think that was one of the things that was misunderstood at the time, that people sort of thought, well, Parliament has passed this, so it must happen. And and, we were talking earlier about, you know, there are Parliament passes bills and and they become acts of Parliament and certain sections don't get implemented. This is slightly different because as you say it's it's a form of planning consent so it's permissive yes the government can build this line if it wants and it can build it in this direction and it will have to make these mitigations uh it put put in place these mitigations if it wants to do it but of course it's got to be funded so you you know it would grant permission for the for the money to be spent but the treasury doesn't have to and that that was one of the misunderstandings but Parliament, I mean, I, I had a colleague at the Hansel Society sit and work this out. He didn't thank me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> going through, through hundreds you're, you're of... You're a cruel leader. I, I'm a cruel leader. Hundreds of, of um, parts of the parliamentary website trying to track all this information down. But 1,300 hours at least of parliamentary time has been spent on these four bills to date. Which is an awful lot. An awful lot. And a lot more time than... The kind of bills we're talking about here in the King's Speech mm. will get during, during Absol- the next absolutely. session. Absolutely. The big criminal justice bill might get a few hundred hours spent on it. 1,300? Not a chance. Yeah. So a question that emerges out of all of this is, 
is this build process for these big infrastructure projects like HS2 the right way to go? Is this the best way for Parliament to deal with them? Is a committee should, of MPs the yeah, right people it, to decide it, should, it all? Should yeah. Parliament be the, the people to decide it? You're talking about taking a trip into Miss Marple country and deciding whether you're know, looking at whether you should have a cutting here or a, a bridge across two fields there. Positioning of a roundabout on a you know a local a local road. Are these really the decisions that MPs should take? But if not MPs, who should take them? Well, that's the thing, and, and, and a small bet here. If you get an incoming Labour government after the next general election. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to do a quite major reform of the planning system to speed up this kind of thing, which would probably mean not having MPs taking these kind of decisions. Because if they want to start building big infrastructure at the start of their term and have something to show for it by the the subsequent election, Mm. they've got to speed up this part of the process, which in any case a lot of critics think is just too granular to really work effectively. And this is this is essentially a process that was inherited from the golden age of steam when yeah. Victorian entrepreneurs yeah. were building the first railway lines across Britain. Maybe it's time that a 19th century process was brought into the 21st century. Yeah, because the alternatives, you know, local planning consent, through I think they call them planning development consent orders, they're not necessarily any quicker for some of these structure, mm. infrastructure projects. If you look at sort of, you know, the building of some of the power stations and so on, you're still looking at 10 years. So from a, an incoming government's perspective, that's no no good either. So, yeah, one to watch in terms of... Absolutely. Of watch watch that space. Or indeed, if the Conservatives decide they want to get their infrastructure moving faster after the, if yeah. they, they win the next election, Absolutely. they may well do something too when they've got a mandate to do it. And it might all be expressed in the small print of their manifestos. We will upgrade the planning system yeah. and that will be the cover they get. But this brings into play an interesting question for Labour in this final session, because you know, looking at the polls, they've got obviously high hopes of getting into government. Um, I think there's a big pressure on the new shadow leader of the House, Lucy Powell, mm-hmm. because she's she's effectively got responsibility for putting together and managing the legislative programme if they get into government. She needs to become to the legislative programme, I think, what Rachel Reeves is to the public finances. So basically saying to her colleagues in the shadow cabinet, you cannot be going out and saying you want this bill or you're going to deliver this bill in 100 days or, you know, whatever it may be, because that programme and the prioritisation of it is going to be critical and it's got to be well organised. They've got to be quite strategic in terms of how they think about about what they're putting together and the order in which bills are introduced, both in the Commons and the Lords. Um, and she really needs to have really command and control of that. Absolutely. Otherwise, with her colleagues, it'll get out of, uh, get out a- of hand. A- absolutely. And if Labour is aiming, and I bet they are, to have a kind of 100 days of feverish activity, aided doubtless by the fact that if the Conservatives have lost the next election, they may be in the throes of a leadership campaign and uh, rather distracted. So Labour will be trying to ram stuff through very, very quickly at the start of their term while all their new MPs MPs are still sort of teeth agleam, desperate to implement the agenda. And that's the moment when they've got to strike, and it's got to be well organised. And the presence of people like Sue Gray, the former Deputy Cabinet yeah. Secretary in Keir Starmer's office now, suggests that they really do want to make the machine deliver very quickly and get off to a flying start. And they're probably, as we speak, concocting detailed plans for that. So watch that space. Yeah, and again, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, um, you know, Good legislation is not necessarily legislation that's been rammed through at speed. So mm. there's, there's, there's going to be this There, this there is tension. a danger with that, absolutely. Yeah. Legislate in haste and repent at leisure. Absolutely. Well, that's the King's speech, Ruth, but I, I'm left with the kind of overriding mystery about why on earth Parliament does things this way. Why do we have what are called legislative sessions, kind of parliamentary years that start with a King's speech and end up with a prorogation ceremony where people in the House of Lords doff caps at one another? Why do they have to have a year and you have to get pretty much all the legislation that's discussed that year passed before the music stops at the end? I can see there might be some virtue in having a hard stop, but it can also be rather inconvenient and give the opposition, as we were just discussing, a little bit of power at the end of the process. So why do they do it that way? It used to be that we sort of had sessions which ran broadly for 12 months, but of course, over the last sort of 10, 13 years, we've had longer sessions, sometimes two years, sometimes well, running the, over the three calendar years. The coalition parliament opened with a two-year session. Yeah, so, so essentially the government decides, and you have state opening at the start of the session, and you have, as you say, prorogation, which is sort of the bookend at the end of the session, which essentially is a temporary suspension of Parliament pending the start of the new session with the next uh, state opening and, and King's speech. From the government's perspective, really, it's about, as you say, it's, it's that sort of hard stop. 
they want to clear the decks. It provides a sort of, if you like, a deadline for Parliament, for both chambers, to get the legislation through. Because if it doesn't get through, it either falls away or the government agrees to, seeks a motion to carry it over into the next session. Now, from the government's perspective, they want to carry over as little as possible because they want that clearing of the decks. They want that fresh start. They want a new legislative programme that they want to take through. But, you know, from Parliament's perspective... It's, it's frankly a bit inefficient because, you know... Well, there's a rather undignified scrabble at the end, isn't there? Yeah, and so there's a lot of sort of rushing to get the legislation the final through its final stages, but also prorogation, this sort of suspending of Parliament at the end of the session pending the start of the new one. Quite a lot of business falls away, so it's not just legislation. If, you've, if you're if you an MP that's asked a parliamentary question and a minister hasn't answered it, it's cleared, cleared away. They it, don't it have to. It just disappears with a pop. Disappears, and, you know, you'd have to then sort of table the question again. Select committee inquiries they carry over but they're paused committees can't meet during the uh, you know in public session during the the prorogation period and of course we've had a prorogation shortly after summer recess conference recess prorogation so parliament actually hasn't sat for that many it's days it's been a weird sort of scatato period where they're there yeah. for a couple of weeks and away for a few weeks yeah. and then back again for a few weeks and bada bim yeah. you know yeah. here we are and i suppose Maybe the origin of this is back in the days of yesteryear when people would travel into Parliament for a few months to pass a few laws as an MP, then travel back to their hometowns, you know, get on a donkey and ride mm. up muddy tracks to <laughs> well, they return to the shires, whatever. And so it made sense to have a rule that, you know, you, you had to sort of finish what you'd started before you went away. And so that was the origin of this whole system. But uh, there's no particular reason, it seems to me, to have essentially a sort of Middle Ages constraint when you're in the 21st century. Do other parliaments actually do this? No, it's pretty pretty rare. I mean, actually, if you look at the, the devolved parliaments, for example, in Scotland, Wales, you know, Scotland doesn't have these sessions. It doesn't, you know, it has an opening ceremony at the start of the parliament after an election, but it doesn't have these these annual sessions. Legislation sort of can ca- carry on through from year to year. There are some advantages I can see from the government's perspective, but really, I just think, you know. One of the things that governments also like is it's it's not just the the, the sort of the legislative program and the you know the, the 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 session approach itself, but it's also having that big state opening king speech at the start of of each session, which which they like because they get to you know, they get to make these big pronouncements about their legislative program, and there is value in those occasions where you get the three constituent parts of Parliament together, the the the, the monarchy. Uh, the parliament and, and government in the same place. I think it was, the, it was the, the journalist and essayist Walter Badgett who said, you know, he this, wrote the great work on the English constitution, who said it's the bringing together at state opening of the dignified, the monarchy, the dignified parts of our constitution with the efficient parts of our constitution in parliament. But frankly, these days, you know, I think we've got, frankly, you look at that ceremony and that parade and you look at the, the state opening and the king and queen on the thrones and so on, the peers sat in ermine. I think there's a bit too much dignity and not nearly enough efficiency. I go back and forth on this a bit because, I, I, <laughs> ludicrously, I, I quite enjoy the dressing up. I oh, quite no, enjoy please. the history. <laughs> I quite enjoy the, the, the sense of history that it gives oh, MPs. Well, yeah, I think it's good for their souls when an MP goes, for example, into the Chamber of the Commons. Good and they, for their souls. They, they walk between... <laughs> statues of Churchill and Lloyd George, the two great war leaders of the 20th century, and, they, and you're thinking this is a serious place. If you relocated Parliament to an industrial unit off the M25 and it, the whole place was done up like a crown court somewhere with a bit of wood panelling and the odd coat of arms... You don't have I to think, go that far. That's, well, a, that's I, I think a great that, extreme. I think that would be ridiculous. I mean, I'm, I'm torn by this because I quite enjoy the sense of history. I quite enjoy a bit of pageantry. It, it plays to some atavistic part of my soul. But I also find myself worrying, if you, if you go through the Palace of Westminster and you look at all the sort of decor and the murals and the symbolism of the place, what you're seeing... Doesn't represent modern Britain. Well, yeah, what you're, <laughs> what you're seeing is a Victorian romantic conception of medieval monarchy. It's like being trapped inside sort of the illustrations to sort of classic children's stories like by C.S. Lewis. You know, you yeah. might, might as well be in Narnia. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, And it's a conception of government that is way, way, way out of date now. 19th century romanticism about the Middle Ages raised up into the shell for a parliament in the 21st century. And I just I just wonder if the vibes are wrong. Yeah. I mean, ironically, the parliament is sort of built, it was built after the Great Fire of 18, was it 1834? 
built largely under a, a direction in terms of the decoration and the internal decoration by Prince Albert, the, the husband of, of Queen Victoria at the time. Very strong resonances of that Victorian era. But ironically, she was the monarch that very rarely really participated in these great occasions after he died because she effectively went into sort of widow's mourning and, and, and didn't emerge. And, you know, state opening as we know it, this grand ceremony really takes off under her son, uh, who who wants to be more visible, you know, wants the pageantry and the ceremony because he wants to sort of assert that monarchy is back after the sort of the, the period of mourning under, on, under Queen Victoria. But I would scrap a lot of it. If we have to have it, let's have it once at the start of the Parliament. But I really don't see why we have to have this rigmarole every every session. I'd scrap sessions and... Um... <laughs> well, but, but the House of Lords hates it, absolutely hates it, when any given newspaper story about the House of Lords is illustrated by pictures of peers in ermine robes in, in the state opening rather than yeah. sort of sombre people in suits... Yeah. debating through the night because they but assume, they do it yeah you know, because they, well, every every year they do that yeah you know. because but the public assume looking on that that's how peers dress for normal mm. business in mm. in the legislature it's not that's what they do once mm. once a year the rest of it they're in normal dress yeah, like the rest uh, of us uh, 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 up to a point fair enough lord copper but i do tend to think that if if you do dress like that and it's an arresting image and newspapers and television are all about using arresting images then i'm afraid it's, it's a fair cop yeah, but if, if the, the image that you're getting is a false one about the nature of your work and, and who you are and what you do, I just think that's, you know, it's, it's not, not in Parliament's interest, not in the House of Lords' interest, I have but to say. If, but, if, but if Parliament is annually a place where silver stick in waiting and woo dragon persuivant and all these people in sort of Alice in Wonderland playing card costumes parade about, and if it's the whole sort of imagined panoply of medieval monarchy on display... It's very hard to dispel that impression. That's the, that's the big image of Parliament that people see. Well, that's just what's there. Yeah, well, hence my point that we should do it once a Parliament, not every not every session, you know, sort of reduce the, the, the power of it. Um, and one of the interesting things is everybody assumes that we've always been good at this. You know, the, you know, one of the things people say is, oh, Britain, and particularly friends from America, will say, Britain's fantastic at this pageantry, the ceremony, you know, you do it so well, best in the world. Well, we didn't always used to be good at it because um, sort of reading back through the history of, of, of some of this ceremony, I mean, the, you know, the cracking example in 1937, the, the current king's grandfather, George VI, his, his state opening, um, they got the timings mixed up and apparently the MPs uh, turned up in the laws before the monarch was ready. <laughs> How they all must have laughed. Yeah, and, and 1901, this sort of uh, this occasion of the, the new king after, after Queen Victoria... He, he was doing state opening, lots of pageantry and ceremony. The MPs were so desperate to see it, there was a stampede and they got they got crushed in the rush and they had, they had to have an inquiry after it, a joint committee of parliament to look at it. But but um, just to take on my back my, my role as Scrooge of Westminster. Um, bah humbug. <laughs> bah humbug. The other element is cost. How much does this cost? And, you know, it's it may in the grand scheme of things in the government budget be very small in comparison to other things. But actually, in 2021 which was a dressed down state opening because of uh, the, the Queen wasn't doing, at the time wasn't you know, wearing the Imperial State crown and all the robes and so on. I mean, that cost 137,000 and that was just the Commons share of the cost. So as I understand it, the House of Commons shares the cost 60%, 40% are paid by the House of Lords. That does not include the cost of Westminster City Council. It doesn't include the cost of the Metropolitan Police Security Operation, which is huge. Uh, it doesn't include sort of the... The, the military parade. Yeah, the, the palace's yeah. own costs. So, you know, you think that this adds up. I mean, in some, some um, years it's been half a million plus for the Commons and Lords costs with all those additional organisations costs on top. So it's not an insignificant issue. And, and you know, when you're cutting, cutting money elsewhere and you're looking at priorities, is this the thing that we need to do every year in a parliament? Or actually, once a parliament, would that suffice? I, I'm, I'm in favour of once a parliament. That sounds like quite an interesting suggestion for them to take on board when the economies are starting to be considered after the next election. Watch this space. 
Well, we've popped over to the House of Lords to talk to Philip Norton, Lord Norton of Louth, Professor of Government at the University of Hull. He's just written a new book about one of the more mysterious and opaque institutions in Parliament, the 1922 Committee of the Conservative Party. Now, uh, Philip, first of all, the, the 1922 Committee is a bit like the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither Holy Roman nor an empire. The 1922 Committee wasn't founded in 1922, and it's not actually a committee. So what is it? That's a very good question, because it's the closest we've got to the Parliamentary Conservative Party, but it isn't the Parliamentary Conservative Party, because it doesn't include all Conservative MPs. It automatically excludes the leader, whether in government or opposition. In government, it excludes the leader and ministers. So, essentially, Conservative private members, which is the official name of the committee. Wow. And what does it actually do? We know it because of the role it plays in leadership elections of the Conservative Party, but, of course, that's a sporadic function. Whereas on a more pervasive basis, it acts as a sounding board for members. It's a way of Conservative backbenchers getting involved. It acts as a platform for them to put their views over. It's also a sounding board for party leaders, for ministers, to hear the views of backbenchers, because you can hear them in a private meeting and have a discourse that you would not have publicly. It's a way of backbenchers themselves scrutinising what their leadership is doing, what ministers are doing, particular policies may be causing uh, concern, so raising that, and also keeping track of the conduct of ministers. It's not just their policies, but obviously some scandal might arise, and that causes um, uh, criticism at a meeting of the 22 Committee, which for some ministers is fatal. They go as a result. So uh, particularly under the uh, premierships of Margaret Thatcher and John Major, you saw quite a number of ministers go, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, uh, Leon Britton, the Trade and Industry Secretary, David Meller, uh, Culture Secretary, among others. There were several others went as well because they'd clearly lost the confidence of Conservative backbenchers. So, so this would have been uh, delving back into ancient Conservative history. Lord Carrington, after the Falklands yep. War, people felt that uh, as Foreign Secretary, he had dropped the ball and had to sort of carry, the, to mix my metaphors, furiously carry the can for that one. Leon Britton, I imagine, is the Westland affair, yep. the, all the weird, intricate party manu- the, the party manoeuvrings and cabinet manoeuvrings around a helicopter contract. And David Meller, it was uh, the scandals around his personal life that, that finished him off in, in the John Major era. Yes, and there are others as well. You may remember Edwina Curry and Salmonella scandal, where she handled that, caused problems. So in some cases, it was the 22 almost getting ahead of the Prime Minister, because John Major said, well, he would have asked for David Meller's resignation, but the 22 had got in there first, decided it's time to go. And as Giles Brander has put it, the chairman of the 22, Marcus Fox, phoned um, David Meller and gave him the black spot, basically. He was out. Parliaments are two chambers. We're here in the House of Lords. You're a Conservative peer. Do you attend? Can can Conservative peers attend as well as MPs? We can. Conservative peers can attend. So meetings of the 1922 committee are not actually confined to members of the 22. Um, you can have p- others invited to attend. So since 2010, ministers have been invited to attend, so they may attend. They're not officially members. Since the late 60s, Conservative peers have been able to attend. So occasionally you will get some ministers, so particularly if it's the Prime Minister addressing the 22, you get a full turnout of not just backbenchers, but ministers, quite a few peers. Normal meetings, hardly any ministers, and I'm the only, probably the only regular attender from the Lords. But Yes, one can attend. And you keep notes of what's said. You've been going for 25 years. I've been attending since I became a peer. So, yes, 25 years. And I've kept uh, contemporaneous notes, which are somewhat fuller than the minutes, which over time have become more sparse. They've never been that full, but they're getting even (laughs) more succinct. So going back historically, looking at it since it was founded in 23, to find out what goes on, the minutes, if you like, are a starting point. It's then looking at diaries, memoirs, occasionally media coverage, really to find out for things like the mood of the meeting. So all the minutes will tell you is who spoke, how many people attended, and it who the secretary was as to how well rounded the figures are. And when there are, for example, really big meetings where the Uh, fate of the Prime Minister is on the line, there'll be journalists outside who can hear the cheers and the banging of desks or non-banging of desks, I suppose. Absolutely. That's quite a key point, actually. Not just what's said, but how many are attending. That's a way for the party leadership, the whips, to assess what's going on. It's not just what's said, but how important is this to the party? They're all crowding in there. What's the mood? And, of course, as you say, the corridor on occasions like that is crammed with 
a journalist, it can be quite difficult getting into the room, whereas other weeks there's just one lone journalist sat out there. The key thing that the 22 does is oversee, as you say, the election of Conservative leaders, and you almost wonder if uh, its members have been on some kind of productivity bonus in recent years because there have been so many leadership elections and so much change and so much destabilisation. How much of that is down to the current rules for electing the Conservative leader where the MPs filter candidates and then the membership votes on them? Yes, it's, the rules have varied over time and the current rules are problematic. So the 22 acquired the power to elect the leader in 1965. Before then, the Conservative Party had this process of emergence. The magic circle. Yes, it was a magic circle. It was not, as some people claimed, the men in grey suits visiting a leader and saying, your time is up. It never happened. Um, so they introduced rules so the MPs then became important. They were the ones who were determining who the leader was. The next big change was in 1975, because then the rules were changed, so the 22 could decide who the leader wasn't, in the sense of removing the leader. There was provision for annual election of the leader, so the leader could be challenged, and of course was. Well, Margaret uh, Thatcher, for example. Well, Edward Heath was the first, that's why the rules were introduced, it was to essentially get rid of him. So Margaret Thatcher was elected under the new rules, but then she was also got rid of under those rules eventually in 1990. But then there was the next big change, was 1998, when the Parliamentary Party was reduced to such small numbers, and it was agreed the party membership would have the ultimate say. So the 22 committee narrows it down to two candidates, and then it's up to the party membership to choose which of those two. But there is an inherent problem, because it's done by eliminating ballots. So if there's more than three candidates, you have eliminating ballots. The final one, you've got three candidates, and the top two go through to the membership. So you could come second in that final ballot with a very small minority of the votes, as happened with Ian Duncan Smith, who got about a third of the votes. If you remember, um, Ken Clark came top with about 56, was it? Duncan Smith got 51, and Michael Portillo, 50. So there's that one vote difference. But that's what put uh, Duncan Smith through. The membership then voted for Ian Duncan Smith, largely because he wasn't Ian Clark. So he was became Conservative Party leader with the support of one third of the MPs. So you can see why it's not necessarily in the most stable of positions. It was exactly the same with Liz Truss, because she got 32% of the vote in that final ballot, just easing out Penny Mordaunt. So you may remember that um, when Theresa May became leader, the, it was going to be a contest between her and Andrea Leadsom. Now, Andrea Leadsom withdrew from the contest, ostensibly because of a, uh, an interview she gave to the Times about Theresa May being childless. But she was already at that stage contemplating withdrawing because she realised she didn't have the support of the Parliamentary Party. She was conscious of the fact that in that final ballot, Theresa May had got an absolute majority of MPs. Do you think, Philip, in a parliamentary democracy, it's it's compatible for the membership of parties to choose the leader? So you've talked about the rules of the yeah. Conservative Party, but it's also true in the Labour Party. Yeah. They've opened leadership up to, to the membership. Part of the problem is that actually membership of political parties is much smaller these days than it was you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So the selectorate, if you like, who are choosing the leader it is much smaller and less reflective of the country than it would have been. Oh, absolutely. I think it's a fair point. If you go back to the early 1950s, you know, the parties, the Conservative Party, largest political party, what, three or four million yeah. members. And since then, the, the membership has shrunk uh, quite markedly. And yet you're giving that body the power to select the party leader. And of course, if you're in government, you become prime minister. And so, yes, there's always been a constitutional objection because the prime minister is prime minister because they rest on the confidence of the house of commons which, so you rely on the majority of mps to sustain you which in government means de facto your own supporters your own mps um, so if you take that away from them it's problematic because the person being chosen is not someone who can demonstrate necessarily they carry the confidence of the house of commons the problem then of course if you think, well, the present situation is unsatisfactory, if you want to change it, how do you get from here to there? How do you tell party members, oh, sorry, you can't have that power. Would you mind voting to give it up? 
Are we looking at some kind of post-election smackdown on this issue, especially if the Conservatives are out of government after the next election, which is not entirely improbable at the moment? Would, would we see perhaps a, a, an attempt, a, a, in effect, a power grab by the parliamentary party to say, we will choose the leader in future? Um, what would happen then? It would certainly give them the leverage to do that, because various schemes have been devised already where you, you don't quite exclude the party membership, you give them a role, but leave it ultimately to... Uh, MPs, but they've not yet come up with a satisfactory formula. But a big election loss might act as a big incentive to actually revisit and change the rules. I suppose a key player in all this is is the current uh, chairman, because it is chairman of the 1922 Mm. committee, Sir Graham Brady, who's also been its longest serving chairman. He's been the longest serving and he's seen off more Conservative Prime Ministers than has the electors. And for the first time, I think, has come out and said... Um, it should revert to MPs selecting uh, the leader. Graham Brady, he's, he's a household name because he's kept his silence and he, he receives the letters. What, what, what is that process? What are the, what are the letters he's getting and, and why? A vote of confidence in the leader can be triggered if 15% of the Conservative MPs write to the chairman of the 1922 committee calling for such a vote. So uh, Sir Graham is the, now the recipient of any letters he keeps account think verifies to make sure the person who claims to have written is the MP who has actually written. It is a bit of a plotter's charter, this system, isn't it? And if you read the oh, extracts I, of the Nadine Dorries book at the moment about the removal of Boris Johnson, you know, you, you kind of think what a gift this is to shadowy cabals to have a system like this. Oh, absolutely, because that's one of the problems with the process is, of course, it's all secret. You don't know who has written because they don't you don't know unless they announce it, and then, of course, you don't know whether they're being honest anyway. So you don't know who's actually put in the letters. So, yes, I mean, any member can do it, free in the knowledge, and they're not going to be held to account for having done so. So a more open process might actually damp down the, the kind of endemic plotting. Yes, if you went to the equivalent of what we used to have in the 19th century with uh, elections, which was uh, open ballot, so you'd list who the electors were and how they'd voted. What a refreshing idea. Philip Norton, thanks so much for joining us on Parliament Matters. My pleasure. OK, so that's all from us for this episode of Parliament Matters. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you get the next episode. Do share your thoughts by reviewing us on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you've got any questions you'd like us to talk about in our special Urgent Questions episodes, go to hansardsociety.org.uk forward slash PM. You can put your questions there. Or you can follow us across social media at Hansard Society. Thanks for joining us. See you soon. Goodbye. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Yeah.